Well, you know, I have a whole lot of scripture for this sermon, but just sensing just the Spirit of God, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to launch and go into uh, the continuation of our Spirit uh, Journey to Christmas um, series, but I'm just going to kind of let the Holy Ghost take me and maybe just highlight different parts because um, it's a real review of things that we already know because, again, what we started with last week was we looked at the fact that that Jesus coming, we call it the New Testament, and it's, it's past halfway through the Bible. Um, you know, there's 66 books in the Bible, and you got uh, 44 of them in the Old Covenant, and then you've got 26 in the New. So, uh, 40 or 44. Anyway, um, so it's more than halfway. I mean, you can just take your Bible and, and look when you get to Matthew, where it starts telling us about Jesus. But as we learned last week, there in the Old Covenant, there's prophecies that, were, that are pointing to the Incarnation. And the Incarnation, as we said, is just part of what it's all about. But it's a crucial step. And I thought we would review that and see the reason why. And so those of you that are coming on Wednesday, this is really reinforced. But... Um, but let's go in and just uh, go from there. And I may switch over to a prophetic chapter and, and another. Well, they're both really profound prophetic chapters from the book of uh, Isaiah and Zechariah. And um, uh, I think I might have gave Ethan Isaiah, but I know I didn't give him Zechariah this morning. So um, let me open up here and we'll just get into um, the beginning. And the beginning, the book of beginnings is Genesis. That's called the book of beginnings. And so how about we go to the book of beginnings, the first chapter, and see where it starts because Christmas starts there. You know, God made a creation. And he had this wonderful plan for us, but we mess it up. And so we'll kind of see that as we go on this journey to get towards the incarnation and that that is just a step towards the crucifixion. And so... Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them, everybody say them, have dominion. It wasn't just, just Adam alone. He had a partnership. And, and it gets summarized, but it's mankind. You know, not just Adam alone, but it was mankind that would have dominion uh, in, this, in this world. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God gave dominion to all of us. When we take some truths, uh, authority and submission and, and, and roles in, uh, in the, in, and take them out of kilter, we can really get into major error. You know, there are ministers that have uh, said, well, I have spiritual authority, and we do have a spiritual authority. I am a position in a position to speak into people's lives. It's sad that in the day and age we live in, a lot of people won't receive the spiritual authority. If you try to correct people in the modern church so many times, um, that, that's it. I'm out of here. I'm here for the feel good. I'm here for the itching ear to tickle my fancy. And if, if I've heard enough sermons, I'm gone. You know, if you, if you tell that story one more time, I can't tell you how many times I heard Brother Hagin tell the same stories, and I just ate it up every time. You know, but it was an act of my will to do that. But you would see people kind of, well, I've heard this one before. I guess I'll get on Facebook while he teaches, you know, Mark chapter 11. Well, turn with me to Mark chapter 11 and, and verse number 23, you know. Uh, and, you know, and there's something new. There's something fresh every time. Or, uh, or telling a story, an illustration. Sometimes it was just stories that he would tell. But I could get something out of it because if we're open and we're receptive, we can do that. And so, so we can do that, um, you know, tune out. But, but I'm here to speak into your life. But there is the rebuke, the rebuke, the correction, the instruction in righteousness, and that's even amongst ourselves. God places us in a body to encourage one another, to bless one another, 
to help one another when we're hurting, but also to bring correction. Hey, you're going, you're going in the wrong direction. If you keep doing that, you're going to end up shipwrecked. You're going to end up having some real problems. And, and, and we want to be able to do that, but, but we'll hold back. And so dominion is one of those things. Women have no role in the church. There can't be women preachers. There can't be women with spiritual authority. There can't do anything. And yet we read in the Bible of, of women who are generals, women who are prophetesses, women who are leaders. We talked about Mary last week, and, and she is to be highly esteemed. Not worship, but highly esteemed. She was blessed among women. And so, so we, we just absolutely honor her and her role and what she did in raising in the natural the Lord. I just, I, I, you know, thank God for, for that. And so there's a, a mutual role. And look at that. So we see male and female, he created them. And he's saying, let them have dominion over the earth. Not the women are going to be like the cattle and the birds and the fish. They're just under me. I'm in charge. Barefoot, pregnant, in the kitchen, and, and doing all that kind of stuff. That's not the thing. We're in a journey together in a role. And there is submission and authority. It's a different message. I'm not going to get into it. But again, I just want to let the Word come alive today. Because this is review. But it's a journey. So that's the way God did it. He made this natural creation. And he, put, and he created man, um, mankind, male and female. He created mankind and put them in charge of it all. And in that sense, they were like a god of this world, having authority over it, dominion over it, a ruler in that sense. Not God, but... The Lord Jesus refers to David and calling them gods. You know, um, human beings created. Well, let's read on and see what else he says about them um, in the next verse. So God created man in his own image. In the image, or the, I'm sorry, repeat the one. In the image of God, he created them. Um, again, verse 26 and verse 27, he created us in his image. We're spirit beings. We just live in these physical bodies. But we're spirit beings. I jumped one, one point ahead. We're spiritual beings. We're created in His image in that sense. We're speaking spirits with an ability to speak with authority and have dominion, to say to a mountain, be removed, cast into the sea, and it will be done when we do it in the authority of Jesus' name. Okay. He tells them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. Again, he says it in the natural over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing. The word subdue it means to bring it under control. You know, it's not just a general responsibility over it. Have you ever seen the difference between someone who is a manager, a leader, and they do it well, and it's a smooth running machine, a smooth running operation? You know, you can look at that and say, wow, look at how well done things are here. It's, it's an excellence and that sort of thing. It's bringing it under control. It's, it's working it. It's, it's, it's causing it to, to function. In the amplified, um, subdue it means using all its vast resources in the service of God and man. That's to subdue it. Using all of its vast resources in the service of God and our fellow man. Okay? Then it says have dominion and dominion means sovereign, sovereignty, control, or domination. We're to literally be in charge. In, in, you know, in that sense, it's like that God of this world. You know, we're in the absolute authority in this world, um, in this natural realm. That was the plan that God had for us. And He rules over us in that sense. There's always that. But He gave this creation for man to rule over. And when we're one, and that's what I started to say as speaking spirits, we can function the way God did. See, we see the Trinity. It said, let us make man in our image. You see the Godhead right there. Not just Jesus. There's, you know, to say there's only one God and, and, and Jesus, and he's just manifested in different names. But when you read the scriptures, 
all that refer to God. You'll see numerous, numerous scriptures that refer to a plurality. Let us make man in our image. Is he, is he schizophrenic? If there's only one Jesus, if it's Jesus only, and, you know, um, pray, uh, baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Is he, is he you know, pray in the name of my split personalities? No, 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 a thousand times no. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and they are all one. Only eternity is going to really reveal all that I'm talking about. I mean, a full getting it. The longer we live, the more we're getting it. And that's why it's a review, but there might be things that we're picking up on in it as I share this journey to Christmas. The Godhead are equal, but have different roles, different responsibilities, and do that in perfect harmony and perfect unity. But the Son submits to the Father. He's just as important. He's just as much God. He's just as valuable and powerful. He's God of the same God nature. He's God. He's one God. That is unique. Our minds can't comprehend it, but there's one. But the Son submits to the Father, and then the Holy Spirit is submitted to the, to the Son. I will go, and then I will send the Holy Spirit. But the, but the Son, as a human, operated under the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the Godhead works in absolute harmony and, and unit, in, in unity as one, but there's, there's different roles. And that's the function of it. But, but see that God is, is God. He's omnipotent. He is glorious. He is, he's God. And we obey God, the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We can worship God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But when we understand roles and functions, we know sometimes we do things addressing or uh, interacting with a particular person in the Godhead. We pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, right? So I pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, and I, I'm very particular about following the way God did. I baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You know, there's one scripture that says baptized in the name of Jesus, but when I look at all of the scripture and Jesus' own instruction, it's baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are baptizing in the name of Jesus according to that other one, but there's more to that, so I want to I want to cover it all. So there's a role. In that sense, we do all three. There is the interaction with the Holy Spirit, yielding to the Holy Spirit, and letting, you know, a move of the Spirit flow through us. And so we're interacting with and in relationship with the Holy Spirit in that well, in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and speaking in tongues, and interceding in the spirit and that sort of thing. Do you see how it all works? But but it's all God, it's all God, one God, but working uniquely each person. And that's this creation. And he made us unique in this world to work in unity with him but have authority. Our authority is over the the earth. So you see these roles and functions and we're to have dominion over this natural creation. Interestingly, that is over all the creation. And when we read the, the early chapters of Genesis, the first couple chapters, we see he created the sun, moon, and stars, the planets, and all of that, the universe. And that, that, that's part of the creation. And so here we have in our times, we've invented spacecraft, and we can go and land on the moon. Now, we have, we have power in this instance in this universe, in this world, and we've exited our planet. We've actually put um, equipment, cameras, rovers on Mars, the nearest planet, which is really far away. It takes years to get there. None of us live long enough to get out of the solar system, but we can get to Mars, but it just takes a long, long time if anybody ever does do that journey. They're already doing scientific and psychological experiments with with astronauts so that they can stretch out that dominion, step out into that. Just like, a, like we had people that, that 
still search unknown, un, uncharted territories in the world. There's not a lot left, but there's still places in the Amazon, you know, people that have never heard the name of Jesus, tribes, people, and all. But there's places where man's never touched it, Alaska and different things. Um, even the United States, I'll bet there's some places in some of our national forests and things like that nobody's ever been. There's, prob there's probably some really beautiful places and things that just engulfed in mass land things. We, have, we were given authority over that, but then man messes up because we were supposed to exercise that authority. Now, let me take you to verse two, uh, chapter 2, verse um, 7 to really build on who you really are um, and why God needs to solve this problem, not just in the spiritual realm, but in the natural realm. The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. And then listen to this. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. We became a speaking spirit. We're more than just a soulless animal. He breathed into us and his life came, gave us life. We have an element of God in us. We're unique in that sense. That's in the image of God. He didn't do that with the other animals. He created them and made them living. It's sad to say they don't have a soul in the sense of, you know, mind, will, and, and intellect and emotions. They can learn things. They can, you know, there's some very smart animals, and they can be very affectionate. My puppy, if I walk out to my truck to get something out of the truck and I come back in, it's an all-new greeting. <laughs> I'm so excited to see you. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a, oh, he's my puppy. He's my dog. Who's the dog? You're my dog. And so it's a whole greeting. Every time I go out, I'm never... It's like, oh, yeah, okay, you. It's you again. Now, Chris might do that. I might do that if Chris walks in. Lisa might do that if I walk in, or she might be like, oh, me. He's home. Is it that time already? Come on, can't we have another hour before I have to deal with this guy? But, 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 you know, but he's always affectionate. But, but it's different. I hope you get that. Just trying to give you this overview of this incredible thing that God did. So he made us in his image. He, he breathed into us of his nature. Breath is... Is in the Greek, it's pneuma. I honestly don't know. I uh, didn't look up the Hebrew word, but pneuma is the Greek the, to breathe in the breath. That's the, you know, the spirit is the pneuma, and and it's a breath. It's, it's to give a voice. But he breathed in his breath, and it, and his spirit came into us and made us a living soul, a speaking spirit. We're unique. Angels marvel at. And they even marvel at where I'm trying to get to. That even when we blew it, that God made a plan because he loves us so much and we're so unique that he cares for us more than any of his creation, even his angels that he created. Angels can't be saved. And so they, want, they wonder and they marvel at God's love and all that he's done for us. And I think that's what I'm sensing, Tony, in this, spirit, in this room this morning. The love of God. His love manifested and, and, and coming from out of each of us because his love is, is deposited with us and then we love one another and we just sense love. Love is a spiritual force, a powerful thing. So we became a living being, unique in, in a sense, in that God class. Not God, but in a, in, a, in a class of having dominion. We say that the lion's the king of the jungle, but there is no delegated authority. He's just kind of called that because of his power and everything else. But a lion can be defeated by some other animal, you know, and everything. Um, you know, he doesn't just speak in all animals, you know, bow and say, whatever you say, your majesty. Just by virtue of his strength and power, you know, he can seem to do that. So we call him the king of the jungle. But who's the king of the jungle? Mankind. And a good king, just a freebie, exercises great care and stewardship over the creation we were given dominion. This is just an extra. 
We live in a beautiful part of the country, and it's just sad when you see people throwing trash out and, and, you know, and doing things. So while I may not be in extreme in the, um, you know, some of the environmental crazy things, because that's become a religion in and of itself, I very much believe in good godly stewardship over this earth in creation. And I think, I think that's, that's of God, that we should take care of it, manage it. And so we can learn some things. We ought to just get along with one another. You know, not just throw the baby out with the bathwater. Oh, you, you believe in environment. Christians should be the greatest conservationists in the world. What's the name of the guy that owns the Bass Pro Shop? Is, um, uh, what's his name? Johnny Morris? Johnny Morris is a great example of that. A God-fearing, God-loving man that really appreciates this creation and does much in the way of conservation and stewardship. Christians should be at the forefront of that because we've been given dominion over it. God doesn't throw his trash in heaven. There's no trash in heaven. <laughs> we shouldn't be doing it in the dominion we've been given. Is this helpful at all to you today? So then we see um, <clears throat> one other aspect. That's the spiritual nature. There's a given, we understand the flesh nature, but it's spelled out as we read Genesis 2, 21 through 23. The Lord caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and he closed up the flesh in its place, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made out of the, and the rib which the Lord had taken from man, he made woman. And he brought her to the man and said, this is now bone of my, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Um, that's the closest we ever come <laughs> to reproduction. That's the womb of man. She was taken out of his rib. But God did his own surgery on Adam. But we see that God caused a sleep to fall on Adam. It's the first surgery, first anesthesia. It was of the spirit. And God opened up that flesh. It says he, he opened it, took the rib, and then he closed up the flesh after he took the rib. And then he says... This is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. So we're not just spirit beings. That's who you, your, your eternal nature is, is a spirit. Every one of you, every one of you watching this, and you may come across this and listen to this message. Every one of us are eternal because of that spirit. We became living beings, speaking spirits in that sense. And that's what I mean by the God class. We're eternal. We can't die in the sense of the atheist thinks you close your eyes in death and that's it, just blackness. It's not that. You know, to believe in that can produce great hedonism, great sin, because it's like you might as well have that philosophy that we read in the Gospels. You might as well eat, drink, and mer be merry for tomorrow you die and that's it, blackness, nothing. So you might as well party it up, live it up, and you see great hedonism, sin in that. But when we realize that we're in that God class in the sense that we are spirit beings and eternal, we're going to live forever either in the presence of God or apart from the presence of God with the God of this world, which, will be, which we're trying to get to, will be in hell. It was created for the devil and his angels, but man that rejects God will go there because we're eternal. So that being the difference would cause us to live a life of, okay, I want to get to know this creator. I want to get to know this God of the universe, this absolute authority. I have an authority, but man, his is a way above mine. His thoughts are beyond my thoughts. I can't even come close. His wisdom's beyond, you know, his, the scripture says the foolishness of God is so much greater than the wisdom of man. The smartest person in the world, it doesn't even come close to touching the foolishness. There is no foolishness of God, you understand. But but, you know, you can't even get to the, there, and there's no weakness, but you understand they're trying to give a metaphor that the greatest intellect of the world, the greatest accumulative intellect of the world, the whole team of NASA engineers doesn't even scratch the surface of the foolishness of God. And so we get that, but we're, we're seeing the flesh part and we're living in that. And, and because he created us uniquely that way, it's a factor and we introduced a problem with it. But, but seeing that we're spirits that live in a 
uh, human body, God gave a, a simple way of living, and it's really not different. And I'm, I'm accomplishing what we need to do because I don't have to review everything. I mean, just listen to Romans chapter 1 through 3, and, and you'll, you'll get it, what we've, what we've been doing on Wednesday. But there's two principles for godly living. Number one, serve God. You know, how do we exercise dominion? How should we be operating? How should Adam have been operating? And he started that way, but he messed it up. Serve God. In other words, be busy doing what he's told you to do. That's, that's what we're to do. Ephesians tell us we were created for acts of service, of good, for good works. Of, you know, we were created for that, to serve God, to exercise that dominion, which is serving God, doing what he told us to do. So, so um, you know, uh, uh, and, and, you know, in, in his pleasure, pleasing him. So we're, we're serving him, being busy. And when you're busy doing what he's told you to do, then, then you don't have a problem with doing what he's not told you to do because I'm busy doing what he told me to do. See, if I go home from work and, and, and spend time with my wife and my children, I'm doing what he told me to do. If I, if I get to where, well, you know, hey, you just got to know I'm young and I need to, I need to still have my life. We got married young, so I'm going to the bar with my buddies. I'm going to do, um, you know... Uh, I'm going to go golfing. I'm going to go on, on hunting trips. Now, all of these things can be, oh, not the bar, I would say, but, you know, but living life, doing things can be fun in and of itself. You know, I don't think we should go, you know, get, get drunk at the bar, but, you know, but living life, doing things, that's okay to have time with friends. That's a part of living the abundant life that we were talking about earlier. But there's priorities in this life. And if we get things out of balance and that's all we're doing, again, that's not full joy. So Christ's joy plus your joy. Be busy serving him, even in those things that you do. You go on that fishing trip with your buddies, that's wonderful. You go on a, on a ladies' getaway, sometimes that's good, especially for, for ladies. But I tell you, guys, it's good for us too to have some activity and do some things in masculine fellowship. You know, and I, I, I mean just amongst us as men, not necessarily the stereotype, you know, because, um, you know, we're going to go shoot guns and, and uh, rope cow, cows and the women are going to go, uh, you know, crochet and have a knitting circle. You know, yeah, the women, I, I, th I think Danielle, I've seen some deer, you know, and these kiddos I think have taken, haven't, haven't I seen pictures, uh, you know, of your, your deer? So, you know, so I'm not talking like stereotypes, but, but there's good of feminine fellowship, of masculine fellowship. But, um, but in that, where was I going with that? Um, you serve God in it. So it's about honoring him, doing it in, in a godly way. Um, you know, maybe witnessing to one of the buddies on that trip that doesn't know the Lord. You know, just sharing a testimony, again, something that will bless them or an encouragement, just listening to some things they may be going through. The second principle for godly living is obey God. Now, there's, there's serve God, you know, but there's obey God. Now, serving God is just, just living your life it, to his pleasure, but obey God is on, on the higher level that, you know, it, it, there's no element in it. You obey. He's told you to do something, you do it. If he's told you don't do something, you don't do it. There's no choice, no discernment, no, no decision in, in that. It's simply obey. That means to resist temptation to disobey God. And this is where Adam failed. See, if he would have remained busy serving God, walking in the cool of the day, um, tending the garden, he, he could have ignored and, and refused the serpent which is where we were going to go next, but we know the story. He could have said no to the serpent and just continued on and, and just went about doing his father's business, serving the Lord. Isn't that what Jesus said? I'm here. I'm a, wouldn't you want me to be about my father's business? That was serving God. But he also obeyed God. Lord, if it be your will, if, this, if there's any way this cup can pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. I, need, I will obey you. I will do exactly what you told me to do. See the difference of serving and obeying? And so if Adam done that, 
we wouldn't have the problems we have today. We know the problems we have today. The sin nature. So verse uh, um, 15 of chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, the Lord God took man, put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it, serve. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Um, and I didn't uh, put the rest of my scripture reference. Uh, but verse 17, <laughs> I don't have it, says, but of the tree of knowledge of fruit, uh, the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat thereof, for in the day that you eat thereof, you, will, you shall surely die. That's the obey. You can, in serving me, in, in do the work, tend the garden, um, you can eat anything I've created, any fruit, any vegetable, any herb. There was no car carnivores in the creation. They didn't eat animals. There was no death. There was no killing. There was no bloodshed. So we could eat of all that, but of one tree, one fruit, one fruit on one tree. It wasn't like any apple tree, any, any of these multiple trees. There's one tree. You shall not eat of that one tree. But what did we do? Got our eyes off um, God and listened to the voice of the tempter. Uh, we, as humans, the, the ones given authority, we decided that, you know, um, even though we had all this other stuff, that that one thing, it was good to eat. And that we could we could know something more. You know, the great lesson to learn in serving and obeying God takes me again. This is where I said we'll just flow with this, because I was just going to go faster and read some scripture through all the way through and hit some interesting things. But the principle is is what's important today. But um, but God makes this plan for us, and 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 it's not complicated. He just wants us really to bask in his love. And, you know, if we make him the priority, you know, he, he would walk in the cool of the day. We had fellowship. Why get your eyes off that onto this other? And they were like, well, I would have, uh, I could eat, and it looks like it would be good to eat. I'd like to taste it. You know, we get that. Our, our flesh sees something. And says, Boy, I'd like to taste that. Sometimes we get unpleasantly surprised. Other times pleasantly surprised. But, but, Getting their eyes and listening to the devil is the is is and and saying I could learn something I could understand the knowledge of good and evil like God if God and this is the principle that I started to refer to if God says you don't need to know it why would you want to know it We have to, and this is where I said I was going to flow freely. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says for, and you can pop that up if you want, Ethan, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. But it tells us to trust, I'll let him get it up there, trust in the Lord with all of our heart. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. So there's a principle that God gives. Um, can you put both of those together, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? We're to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. It's a heart thing. We're just to live in the love of God and, and trust in the heart. Get out of our heads. We, not, we don't need to figure everything out. I don't know everything about auto mechanics. I worked at and managed a place that rebuilds car engines, and I still don't understand all the principles of an internal combustion engine. Even though I've done a, a rebuilding um, and knew every component of it, but the principle of it, I, I, you know, I, you know I, I'm not an expert at it. Making one or remaking one, machining them, and processes and how to do all of that, I'm, I, I got that. But the actual function of it, I take my car to the mechanic. I've been filling my engine or uh, my uh, radiator up, you know, the reservoir up with uh, coolant on a regular basis. So there's a leak in the system somewhere, and the heater stops heating when it gets low, 
it's like, okay, I better, I better get some more in there because it doesn't get hot on the temperature, but just enough that it drops down and it's like, okay, I got to get some more in there. So I know there's a leak, but I don't know where that leak is at and where to get it at, so I got to just get some money set aside, go and fix it. Maybe I have some money set aside. Get that thing fixed. Lisa bums out when that thing doesn't heat up. We're driving home from Illinois, and she's like, when did you get your heater fixed? I was like, I didn't. I just put some coolant in it because <laughs> it had gotten low. We were doing it. She's like, you know, she she's freezing all the time. I'm like, it's hot in here, and she's under blankets. It's, ooh, ooh, let me give me the coffee. Let me hold the coffee cup. We are very much opposites in that. <clears throat> and so, you know, anyway, <laughs> I don't know why I got in there. But, uh, but, we don't need to know some things. We trust in God with all of our heart. It's a heart thing. It's just loving Him, living for Him, wanting to do what He wants and not doing what He doesn't want us to do. And it says, um, lean not to your own understanding. Don't try to figure it out. You don't need to. You don't have to. I can drive a car without understanding all of that. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. See the busyness, the service in everything you do to serve God? Even in your fun and your casual nature and your interaction with family, friends, life and living and doing all that, acknowledge God. Incorporate Him into it. And you won't get sidetracked and distracted. You can just say, no, devil. I'm enjoying this life. I enjoy my family. I like the old Christian comedian that said, you know, uh, talking about the temptation of a woman. It's like, you know, hey, when you got filet, who wants green bologna? You know, hey, you can have me. It's like, man, I got filet. <laughs> be like Jesse Duplantis on the airplane when the woman was hitting on him and saying, you want to go uh, be together and when we land? And he's like, he stands up, Jezebel! <laughs> he's like, I don't even want to be tempted. And just says, get away from me, Jezebel, because we can be tempted. Be busy serving God. <laughs> you see it? Don't lean to your own understanding trying to figure it out. Well, we're created, we're just like other animals. No, we just read that. That's the big idea that God's saying. Is your spirit beings in the God class, speaking spirit of His nature. Not God, but of His nature in the God class in that sense. You're unique. So when the world says we're just animals and we have animal instincts, I get amazed at some of the feed on Facebook. It's such a battle for me. I turn it on and I go, oh, I just don't want to see some of this stuff people say and believe and think and do and promote and, and you know... Some of it is like, we're just, we're just biological organisms. We're created animals. And so, uh, so they're, you know, monog it's just not natural to live with one person. But God said, husband will leave the father and mother, if we read on, and cling to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. A, a man, a woman, in matrimony for a lifetime commitment in covenant. Not, oh, I'm an animal I can, so I can just be with others. You know, there's a TV show I saw a commercial for. It's something about all the wives this guy has. They're advertising, you know, all these, he's got wives. I guess he's a Mormon or something. I don't know what he is. But that's crazy. Can we not read the Old Testament and read the trouble David got in and Solomon... Uh, was so corrupted by his dad's lifestyle of concubines and multiple women that he took it to the, I mean, that's what happened. What, what, you, what you condone, the next generation's going to embrace. Another generation completely celebrates it and promotes it, and we're living in that day and age. So Solomon became, man, his father's son in that regard, and it just messed him up so much. Did you know people get, they, I marvel at this, the Bible talks about all the kings of Israel, and it, and it sums them up in the Chronicles. It says, this king lived, he, he, he was born, he, married, he took the reign in this day, and then he, he did this, and he died, and they'll highlight, sometimes it's just their age, but sometimes it might have a highlight, and say, but he lived, he was born, and he died. And then it says, he did evil in the sight of the Lord or he did good in the sight of the Lord. Do you know King Solomon went down in the eternal word of God as having done evil in the sight of the Lord? He didn't do these two principles to serve God and obey God. 
He started making his own plan. And whenever man does that, we mess it up. And that's what Adam did. We know he partook of the fruit. And it introduced the sin nature, and he surrendered his authority from himself over to Satan. They partook, and when God said, in that day you'll surely die, they didn't die that day. Physical death began that day. But they lived for hundreds of years more. So when God said, in the day you eat, you'll die, he's talking about the spirit. And the spirit man died, and it doesn't mean it ceased to exist. It means spiritual death is separation from God. Spiritual death is I'm now separated from God. Sin has blocked fellowship with God. And now I'm under the God of this world. I've turned my life over to the God of this world. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go where he goes. And I'm going to live the way he wants me to live. And he's evil. God, everything good, everything perfect, everything wonderful, everything of love and grace and mercy and truth and forgiveness and kindness and, and all the things that benefit us are from, are, are from God. It's all he wants from us. There's not a malicious bone. I mean, there's no bones in this. But there's not a malicious part of his nature. Not a mischievous part of his nature. Just love and desiring the absolute best for you. So, great tragedy. Man turned dominion over to Satan. Let me just give you a couple references to that, and then we'll pick it up next week on our journey to Christmas. And, uh, and we're going to have a, you know, the day after Christmas. I know it's the day after, but it's still going to feel like Christmas weekend. So the day after, I think what we're going to do, I thought about just making that next Sunday, but I'm going to, wrap this up with a flow that's going to be real interesting to you because this laid a stage and then um and then christmas mor well the day after but the christmas morning service or day after um we're going to do what god made christmas all about from the very beginning we're going to come and worship him you know i don't believe the wise men were at the at the manger we'll talk about that next week uh but the, the shepherds came and worshipped him. And we're going to just worship him. And, and not like the Thanksgiving, we're going to tell testimonies and, and can just praise the Lord. We're just going to worship him. Just a sweet hour or so of prayer and worship. We have songs incorporate. We may be praying the Spirit and you know that sort of thing. Anyway, we'll do that. But we'll wrap this up next week. But let me give you a couple where Adam blew this, because you see the beautiful plan God had. Adam and Eve would still be here if, it, if they didn't do what they did. But when they ate of that, they, physic they spiritually died, which began physical death, and that's why they're not here. But we see Revelation 12, 9, it says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, all the way back to Genesis, the serpent of old, Genesis 2. Do you see that reference? He's the great dragon, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. That's his purpose. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So we see this serpent that uh, was instrumental in bringing Adam and Eve down. And then 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in whom the God of this world. Pastor, you really offend me when you call Satan the God of this world. Sorry, the Bible does. I'm just preaching the word. Again, we understand one who has dominion and can subdue, and that's what he's doing, but he's limited. So he walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But, he, but this world system, he's the God of it, and that's why it's such a mess. God has nothing to do with it. Adam and Eve invited, turned it over to him, and he's the God of this world. But you see it? It says it in the Bible. He's the God of this world, and he's blinded the minds of them which believe not. See, that, that's his purpose, is to deceive. When he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, according to John 10.10, 10, it comes through deception. If you, if you eat of this, you'll just be like God. You'll know the difference between good and evil. And it's good to eat. They were already like God. We saw that. 
Now they became like Satan. They got the sin nature. See that? Boy, that's God's really brought this one for in a nutshell. That's what the Holy Spirit can do. Like, where are we going? How are we going to do this? Verse uh, um, uh, uh, chapter four, verse four. Um, it says uh, one of these was First Corinthians. Did I get the right reference up there? Yeah, you read. You got the other one right. I think you had it up there. And then Second Corinthians four four. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded? Oh no, that's what it is. The first one I did was King James. Thank you, Ethan. And then the, the second one says, whom the God of this age has blinded. But see how it's our minds. It's, that's where the problem is. And that takes you back to Proverbs 3, 5. Just trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, His authority, that He knows best, and I'll trust Him. Not try to figure it out. Not try to understand. I'll just trust Him. I'll live by faith. I'll walk by faith. And when you do that, you will succeed. You will prosper in what you do. God will bless you. You'll have test trials and tribulations, but you will overcome and you will walk in victory in this earth. You can take authority over the devil. So, um, so that's what that's all about. And that's where he became. We see the God of this world. And so Jesus, all about the journey to Christmas, is he comes to fix the problem. And we're going to talk about that next week. But we've got to let you go home and have some lunch this week. Anybody want to take me to lunch? I'll take leftovers to Lisa. No, I'm just teasing you. I'm just teasing you. I'm going to either get her something on the way. Um, maybe she'll text me. Are you really getting me something? Yeah, I got birthday money. I'm going to treat her. I'm going to get her a bunless burger from Hardee's unless she says, no, I'm not in the mood for that. Give me this instead. And we'll uh, make sure she doesn't try to cook or do anything. Kids, you're on your own. I'm not buying you anything. You guys are rich. You guys all, well, no, I'm just teasing you. I'm going to get some lunch. All right, you ready to go home? Father, we thank you so much for your word today, for blessing us, for this spirit of love, of this peace, Lord, in this sanctuary. God, we've received, before we worshiped, before we prayed, before we sang, you could just, just sense the love of God, the love of God flowing out of one another. It just, just feels good to be here. And we're just so good, just like David, it's so good to go to and be in the house of the Lord. We can say amen to that. It's good to have been here today. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, his anointing upon this word and giving some direction. I believe, Lord, it's, it's different than my plan, but it was, it was topically the same thing. And I believe, Lord, that you accomplished revealing some things to some people who needed that and, and things to all of us, Lord. Uniquely different. Different things at different points. But given different different uh, meaning to each one of us where we're at in our own personal walk and journey. And I thank you so that we all, because of that, leave better than we came. And we're leaving in the power of the Holy Ghost and the power of your love. And we're going to take that love to the world. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen.